First up, RevenueCat is putting on an awesome hackathon called Ship a Ton. And the idea is to get you to finally ship that side project. And to incentivize you, there's over $25,000 in prizes over three categories. The first category is the most likely to make money. Kind of self-explanatory, right? What's the best business idea? What's the most likely to bring in revenue? The second category is the Revenue Cat Design Award, which is most innovative idea or beautiful app design. And third is the Build in Public Award, which will go to someone sharing their progress, sharing their journey, and taking feedback from the community, like actively building it in public. And these categories will be judged as I scroll down here by members of the community, including yours truly. So I'll be judging your apps in these various categories and the prizes for each of the categories is first place, $5,000. And I think I scrolled past it pretty quickly. Your app will go on digital billboards all over San Francisco if you get that first place in one of the three categories. Second place is $2,500. And third place is $1,000, again, in each of the categories. And even if you don't win, you're going to get some cool Revenue Cat ship a ton swag. So you can't really lose. If you're building an app and want to participate in this hackathon, I highly recommend it. So you're going to go to this site, Revenue Cats, ship a ton. You're going to join the hackathon. You can see over 500 people have already joined. And the requirements are that it has to be version 1.0 of the app, right? You can't just update an existing app. You have to be shipping that side project for the first time between now and September 18th is the cutoff. And it has to include Revenue Cat's SDK with at least one in-app purchase or subscription. So I've seen a lot of people on Twitter posting their journey, building in public, sharing the apps they're building specifically for the ship a ton. Like I said, you can't really lose whether you win the 5,000, 2,500, 1,000, or just some swag. At the end of the day, you shipped your product, right? Isn't that the real prize? So I'm a huge fan of this hackathon that Revenue Cat's doing. It's an awesome event. Like I said, I volunteered to be a judge. Here we are, and they did sponsor this episode of Swift News, this segment, to get the word out. And like I said, if you're building an app, definitely join this. This is awesome. Next up, I wanted to share a thought-provoking post, and it is, the way we interact with apps is changing, so should the way they're designed. And the gist of this, I highly recommend checking it out, by the way, it's very visual, Good long article, but the visuals are nice. But the gist here is that, you know, no longer are we just designing an iPhone app in the UI on the phone, and that's how the user interacts with our product. Nowadays, it's widgets, lock screen widgets, you know, Siri, complications, shortcuts, live activities, and here in a little bit, Apple intelligence. So the perfect example of this, and I'll scroll down to it here, is the weather app. Like, I don't know about you, how often do you open up the weather app and actually see the full blown app? I mean, I do from time to time, but the vast majority I'm interacting with the weather app is either via my home screen widget or a complication on the watch. I rarely open up the app. And that's the gist of this article is to flip the design paradigm on its head. And by the way, my disclaimer, I'm not saying, oh, this is the way you must design apps. Like I said, it was very thought provoking and they have a point that looking at apps as a series of actions and information to display and it can be displayed on various interfaces, whether that is the iPhone UI for sure, or a widget or a lock screen complication, or not even a visual interface, but through Apple intelligence and having Siri do everything. The point here is that designing the app from the ground up, thinking of that, because I know I do this as well. I think of the iPhone interface first and foremost, that is what it is. And then you tack on the widget, you tack on the Siri shortcuts, you tack on this behavior where it flips, but the idea here is to flip that around and think about your actions and your information first and the interfaces second. And like I said, it just was very thought provoking. I thought it was a very good thought, especially with Apple intelligence coming up where I believe a lot of the times people interacting with our apps in a few years is going to be via Apple intelligence where they don't even see the app. It just all happens in the background. So something to think about. And if you've been following Swift News for the past few months, you know I've been preaching this app intense. That's what drives all of this. So here's the curated iOS newsletter. They have an episode dedicated all to app intense. So if you're not familiar, app intents is what surfaces those little self-contained actions to the system to be handled by, you know, interactive widgets, control center, spotlight, Siri, Apple intelligence, like app intents are going to be one of, if not the most important frameworks going forward as an iOS developer, in my opinion, in this new Apple intelligence world. So what curated iOS did was it's kind of like a central hub of all the information to get you started working with app intents, all the various WWDC sessions over the years, and some key articles from people in the community, Antoine Vanderly, Keith Harrison, Jordan Morgan, as basically a starting point. And I have this bookmark personally for when the time comes to get serious and really do the deep dive on my app intents, which should be very soon. This is the first place I'm going to go to get started with that. 
Moving on, we have Fat Bob Man's blog, Common Misconceptions About Swift UI. And this is funny, this article, I thought this as I was reading this intro, I was like, this sounds like AI. And he has a disclaimer saying that a lot of people said this sounds like AI. Irrelevant, whether it's AI or not, it brings up interesting points that I wanted to share. So some common misconceptions about Swift UI uh, is that it's super easy to learn and use. And I think that goes back to, I remember the introduction of Swift UI where it was like, blowing everyone's minds. And I was like pretty skeptical at first. I mean, I love Swift UI now. That was just my first impression. But I remember they showed like list being like two lines of code. And remember, we're coming from the UI kit world where, you know, you had to do the UI table view delegate and reusable cells and all that stuff. Like building a simple table view or a list was a decent chunk of code. So when they put up a list with like four lines of code, everyone was like, what? But that leans into this. Is it easy to learn and use? And on the surface for simple use cases, like, yeah, it is. But I think the misconception here is that people say, oh, if your UI is complex at all, don't use Swift UI. You need to go UI kit. And I disagree with that. And that's also what they say here. I'll scroll down a bit. When developers face complex layouts and interactions, if they do not deeply understand Swift UI's unique layout logic, internal mechanisms, basically like, do you really understand how Swift UI works and what it's doing? You won't be able to build those complex layouts. And I, I laughed at this line. In such cases, some developers might mistakenly think SwiftUI's capabilities are limited without realizing that the issue lies in their shallow understanding of the framework. Shots fired. <laughs> I laughed out loud when I read that. Now, don't get me wrong. Yes, UIKit is objectively more flexible than SwiftUI. You can do so much. But like I said, I think the misconception is one end of the spectrum is, oh, SwiftUI is only for the super easy default layout stuff, and it can't do anything complex. I believe, and that's what this article is saying as well, it can do more complex things than you think. Yes, it can't go all the way to the crazy custom UI kit world, but it can handle more stuff than, than you think when you really understand the framework. The next point they bring up is write once, run anywhere. Yeah, I experienced this when building Creator View for the iPhone, iPad, and the Mac. In general, yeah, a lot of the work is done for you, but there's still a lot of work to get things specific to each platform. Yeah, sure, a list or a form will look like it should on an iPhone and on a Mac, but there's just a lot of different design paradigms where you can't use the same screen. For example, the Mac, you know, you have a mouse and a keyboard and a pointer and you want to be precise and small versus a phone, you know, your mouse and pointer, your fat fingers, so you want to be big and chunky. So a lot of times your layouts won't carry over between the two. Anyway, they sum it up here by saying it's not write once, run everywhere. It's learn once, apply everywhere. And I really like that philosophy because yes, the underlying way things work in SwiftUI both apply to macOS and the iPhone or the iPad, but you can't just use the same exact code. So that is a misconception, even though yes, to be fair, it does handle a lot of the work for you, but to take an iPhone app and make it be a great native Mac app does take a lot of work. The same code is not just gonna carry over. And we'll finish up with this one. SwiftUI is more than just a UI framework. And I've been guilty of describing this to people because a lot of times people will say in the comments or you know, new people into this space will say, should I learn Swift or SwiftUI? And I'm like, well, SwiftUI is just the UI framework. Swift is a the language. They're two separate things. So I've been guilty of explaining it that way too, but SwiftUI is more than just the UI framework. I mean, it's a totally different way of thinking. You know, the imperative of the UI kit land versus declarative and the way data flows when using SwiftUI. So it isn't just UI, and that may be a common misconception. But anyway, check out this article. They dive deeper into a lot of these misconceptions. Uh, I thought it was good to know, especially if you're just getting started off in this world. And speaking of this world, I wanted to share this WWDC video from this year, a Swift tour, explore Swift's features and designs. And essentially this is an overview of the Swift language. So it's gonna cover a lot of the basics, but I implore you, even if you are an experienced developer, watch this. Because what I've found is it's this weird paradox. It's like, the more I know, the more I learn from these videos, if that makes sense. So watching this video as a beginner, I'm like, oh yeah, that's how you do a VAR. That's how classes work and all that stuff. And that's fine. But it's almost like there's like levels to it. And it's like the higher level you get, the deeper understanding you have, the more you get out of these videos. So that's the point of sharing this. If Even if you're experienced or you've been doing this for a couple of years and you understand the basics of Swift, watch this because the way something gets ingrained into your brain, the way it becomes deep knowledge that you just know to your core, is through the repetition, learning it, seeing with it, working with it, coming back to the videos, relearning the basics after you've learned it and worked with it. Like that's how you become an expert in something. And that's what was going through my mind as I was watching this video is that, yeah, this is a lot of the basis of Swift, but I feel like it's strengthening my core foundational knowledge. So I wanted to share it. And if you are just learning Swift, Paul's got a great article here, Making Mistakes While Learning Swift. And this resonated with me because it stemmed from an email he got. 
It says, I keep making mistakes and have to go back and fix them again and again and again, and frequently make more mistakes while trying to fix the first mistakes. You never seem to screw up in your streams. How many more years until I get to that point? And I've heard this sentiment before where they say, you make it look so easy. Like, ah, when, when am I gonna be you know, as good as you? And in my mind, I'm like, oh, you didn't see the two hours I was prepping. You didn't see the three rehearsals. You didn't see me edit out all the mistakes, right? So I want to share this because I know many of you out there are learning through Paul's writing or Paul's 100 Days of Swift or many YouTube videos like mine. And there is a misconception out there that it's just easy for us. We just type it, go. We don't make mistakes, nothing. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Like Paul says it down here. Finally, I want to mention all those hacking in Swift plus live streams take a lot of preparation. Not only do I build the full project ahead of time, I rebuild it multiple times on the actual stream to make sure I've really gotten the code as smooth as I can and to make sure there's a logical flow through the tutorial. And that's the key here, right? If I just opened up my laptop, hit record and said, all right, let me learn how Groupbox works in Swift UI and started putzing around and looking through documentation, testing things out. It would be a two and a half hour video and most of it would be spent of just me staring at the documentation like this with a dumb look on my face, right? That doesn't make a good YouTube video and it's hard to follow along and learn that way. So that's the trade-off. Yes, watching these videos and these content creators may seem like, oh, it's so easy, I'm not good enough. That is not the case. But the trade here is that I would rather give you a clear, concise, to the point video that really helps you learn the concept, then give the accurate portrayal of me learning it for two hours. So all that to say, if you're learning from content creators, don't have this misconception that we're wizards and we know everything. No, we have the benefit of practice, rehearsal, video editing, like it's not real life. Like the reality of it is we all make mistakes. We all make silly mistakes. Like I don't think a day goes by where I don't have a bug or something wrong with my code. And I'm like, I finally find it and it's something silly and I'm like, oh, I'm an idiot, fix it and like move on. Like that happens three or four times a day. That's just the fact of life as a programmer. It's a very humbling job. Moving on, I want to share an article from Antoine Vanderlee and congratulate him on going indie from side project to going independent. And the reason I want to share this is because Antoine is just starting his indie journey and he talks about that here. We'll cover that. But I am kind of coming out the other side of my indie journey. I went indie in 2019, so I've been doing it for five years. And a couple months ago, I went back and got a full-time job. So I'm gonna give you both perspectives here because Antoine just went indie after seven and a half years at WeTransfer, that's where he worked. He talks through his story uh, to sum it up, basically doing side projects. They started earning a lot of revenue. Then he switched to a four day work week to where he got to focus one day a week on all the side projects, which then blew up his side projects even more. And eventually it got to a point where, you know what? These side projects are making as much or more than his salary. So he decided to go full-time independent. And that's like the dream for so many developers. Not saying you have to be a content creator, but just making money, building your own apps. I would argue most of us would trade a day job any day for that. So all in all, that's great. Going indie, congratulations, Antoine. Awesome stuff. But I do want to share that it's not all sunshine and rainbows as someone that's just kind of coming out the other side of it. And to be clear, I'm not saying don't go indie. Like, it's great. The pros outweigh the cons. But I do want to at least talk about the cons. In this line, Antoine wrote made me think of it where he says going fully independent feels like joining the champions league of creativity fully challenging my skills to make the most out of products that i've built independently i simply have to give this a go and i'm fully confident that'll bring me to the next level in my career agree 100 percent, all good stuff the champions league of creativity though is what made me think of this is that i used to say right i mean i still say it but it's like i have to wake up and invent my job every day that sounds fun and awesome but when you're four or five years into it, into the grind, and you know your decisions affect how much money you make. Like if you're building the wrong thing or working on the wrong project and that project fails and doesn't make money, well, that affects your livelihood, right? So there's pressure on what you work on and you have to invent like the best way to do it. Like I said, you have to invent your job every day. And after a few years, I just remember like yearning for like, I just wish someone would tell me what to do and I did it. I didn't have to think about this. Like that sounds very attractive after this grind. Another part about the grind is it can be lonely. Like you don't have a team that you're working with. You're, you're by yourself. That's what happened to me. I just kind of got bored and lonely. Also, I struggled with motivation. Um, and this is, you know, a great problem to have. Don't get me wrong. But once you have any level of success and you're making enough money to where you're not like sweating the money, I struggled with motivation. Like, you know, no, you have no one to answer to but yourself. And good money's coming in more than I needed to live. So who cares if I take a day off? No big deal. What's my boss going to fire me? No. And what happened to me is that was a slippery slope. That started to becoming out ah, one day a week or two days a week. And don't get me wrong. I was I'm still able to pay my bills. I was doing fine, but I wasn't making the most out of the opportunity and building the business as big as it could have been. And that's because I was accountable to no one. Things were going good. Why not treat yourself kind of thing? But looking back, I regret that a bit. So 
Going indie is great. Uh, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. It is actually very difficult. But if you can do it, I recommend it. Like I said, the pros greatly outweigh the cons. So congrats, Antoine. Can't wait to see how it turns out for you. And lastly, I want to talk about optimizing your paywalls with a video from Ariel here from AppFigures with Jake Moore of Superwall. Did a full hour tearing down paywalls. And it kind of brings it back full circle to the Revenue Cat ship a ton, right? If you're shipping that side project, you're monetizing it with Revenue Cat, you got some in-app purchases in there, well, you're going to want to optimize that paywall. And of course, I know not everyone's going to watch an hour long video on paywalls. At the very least, there's like a 10 minute section on this app, Resume, where there's a lot of gold being dropped on paywalls. But in general, they talk about, you know, should you have a lifetime plan? The pros and cons of that. How many plans should you have? When should you show your paywall? Should you have multiple paywalls? Should they be contextual? Like so many great tips are in this video, but there's a lot of them concentrated in this Resume app because this app is pretty successful, does a great job. And I especially like the advice on this one where you show your highest lifetime product, whether that's your annual plan as just the only plan. And then when they dismiss that, right? If they say, oh, that's too much for me, they dismiss it. You see a secondary paywall that, okay, now here's the weekly, monthly, annual. And that annual can serve as an anchor. But what that does is that drives people to your highest lifetime value plan, which typically is like your annual. And only the people that say no to your annual will then see the weekly and monthly. And I don't think this is a dark pattern. I know people, you can get kind of weird with this paywall tricks that you can play. And the truth is like, yes, you can be the pure developer. My app is a work of art. I don't want to bug my customers and that's fine, but your app is probably always going to be a side project, make a little bit of money. And if that's what you want, cool. But if you are a developer trying to make a living from your apps and generate as mu much revenue as possible, maybe you have a team, then these strategies will come into play. But anyway, tons of great paywall tips. So if you are participating in ship a ton and you want to earn a little bit of revenue from that side project, you're definitely going to need to optimize your paywall. And let's scroll down to the judges here, this handsome guy. I can't wait to see what you guys build. I'm so excited to look through all these apps. All right, we'll see you in the next episode.